Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again. Today we're going to be looking at a little bit more of a light title, and it's not really a war game per se, but it definitely fits the historical genre. We're looking at Game Developer Tycoon, or Game Dev Tycoon, which is a, a new game on Windows 7. It just came out within the last day or two to Windows 7. Um, and in it, you basically take on the role of a gaming company starting in the 80s and working your way through to the present day. So, uh, let's get into it. So we'll call ourselves Historical Games, and I'm just going to name myself HG for Historical Gamer. You can customize your character a little bit here, but I'm really not looking, you know, I'm not in the mood to do that right now. So, go ahead and just jump right in. I don't need a tutorial. Okay, so, we're into the game. You can see you start off the game as a single developer in your own garage, so obviously you're, you know the way a lot of gaming companies uh, started off. So let's do a military simulation. So real quick, sorry, I didn't want to jump through all that. Um, you start off, there's a whole bunch of topics uh, you can choose from, um, but initially you start with just four topics for your game. So it could be a sports, military, medieval, or space game. We're going to start with a medieval game. And then you can choose a combination to go with that. Now some combinations go better with certain genres than others. Um, but for military, I think simulation would be a good fit. And then you can choose what platform you want to develop for, so either the G64 or the PC. So, um, obviously the G64 has a larger market share, but it also has four times the development cost, so I'm not sure if it's worth it. Uh, the G64, I'm sure, stands for the Commodore 64. So let's just go with a PC game here. Now you get to pick between different graphic levels. Obviously the nicer the graphics the more expensive it is. We're going to start with a text-based simulation. Once you get into the actual development process there is a series of slider bars which help you decide what you want to put emphasis on over the course of three different development stages. Um, they take a little bit of getting used to to be honest. It's not something that I'm terribly comfortable or familiar with at this point. Yeah so and as you develop the game you can see you get little bubbles that kind of pop up for designer technology. Bugs also will crop up through the course of designing your game. And you also earn research points which can be used to unlock other categories. We'll look at that in a moment here. Like I said, this is a bit more of a um, just kind of a you know, I wanted to do something a little bit different with this video. So then the research element I mentioned here, you can research a topic. So you can research new topics, you can create a custom game engine. In this case, we don't really have enough research points for a game engine. So we're just going to research a new topic, you know, racing, fantasy, sci-fi, pirates. We're going to go with fantasy because I think that's probably a pretty popular category. When you do release a game, as you can see here, you get reviews from different uh, gaming magazines, if you will that come out and basically review your product. So obviously you can see there my first game has pretty low reviews. Could be tied to the fact that it's a text-based sim, but it is the 80s, so that wouldn't be too ridiculous. And once the game comes out, you get a little kind of chart along the right side of the screen um, that gives you the sales uh, of the game over the course of its life. Also, as you develop a game or as you um, develop more games, you can view your game history. So the review score and the console are on the left, as well as the name and the type. Gives you the units sold, cost, income, profit, when it was released, average score, and then the top sales rank. So this didn't even crack the top 100. Let's develop a new game. We'll name it OOTP for Out of the Park Baseball, and we'll make it a sports simulation. Put this on the PC. We'll keep text base. So as you move on through the game, you'll also get, you can, you know, open up an office, have multiple employees rather than just yourself. You start off in your own garage, as I said, but you definitely don't have to stay there forever. I think one thing that's pretty difficult to get to used to is the kind of the bars, if you will, for development here. Let's see. Well, I made 22 grand. That game wasn't, it was at least somewhat profitable. 7,000 copies. Not bad, I would say, for a game developed in a garage by one guy. New record! So you can obviously level up as well. Now, as I'm playing through this, I did want to just kind of go over a few things. Um, one is that um, this game, you're gonna, if you're familiar with um, game dev story on iPad or, um, sorry, on iOS or Android, this game obviously would probably seem very similar. So as I was saying, um, if you're familiar with games, um, if you're familiar with 
game dev story, it probably seems really similar. That game is made by Carrysoft. There are a lot of similarities in this game to game dev story, and um, in that sense, it's you know it's it's not necessarily a new genre. There's numerous business simulations that uh, exist out there for gaming, just not these two, um, not just these two. So you know it's definitely something that's been, but it's an interesting topic to me, especially this game where kind of the more polished feel of it than Game Dev Story. It feels more like a, a simulation with the exception of those sliders which do kind of throw off the feel of the game a bit. It does feel a little bit more of a serious game than Game Dev uh, Story. Game Dev Story feels pretty arcadey where you can you know earn boosts and other things like that to make your games better. Um, in that sense, like I said, it does feel very arcadey. This is definitely somewhat arcadey. I mean, obviously it's kind of cartoony, but at the same time, it is, from uh, a number side, it seems to be more business-oriented, if you will. Um, and that's one thing that I, I do enjoy. So one other thing, and this is similar to Game Dev Story, you can uh, work on contracts where basically you take on other programming work. I do think that that's actually a... Um, a nice little feature to include in any of these types of games is that contract feature because there are a lot of developers out there especially more niche products uh, like war games these days um, where you know the m main work is work they do on the side through like contracting and things like that whereas um, the actual games are kind of side projects just because they like it so that's kind of where the contract work comes in especially when you're first getting started one other thing this game has, as I said, it's based on the real gaming industry, so you will see historical consoles released as the game proceeds. Obviously the TES is meant to be the NES, or the Nintendo Entertainment System. And you get nice little news articles kind of giving you the state of the industry. You get little notices basically saying what the market share of one game is over another. So there's a lot of nice little touches that are added to this game. As I said, the game is new to Windows 7. It was available on Windows 8 uh, previously. So it's not a totally new game. It's been out for a little while, but it's new to Windows 7. It's also over on Green... They're also trying to get greenlit, so if that is something you're interested in, go on over to Steam's Greenlight and, uh, you know, give the game a vote. Also, as the game progresses, you do get different sales milestones and records that you get notices for. It's another nice little feature. The news aspect is what really kind of makes me feel like the game is more engrossing and less arcadey. But really, the main thing that makes it feel like less of an arcade game is um, the fact that you don't have boosts and other things like that. At least as far as I can tell. One other thing that'll happen from time to time is you will get little notices that, you know, someone wants to do an interview or something like that, and it's a way for you to gain hype or, you know, press for your game, and also a way to boost sales. Just as in other games like Game Dev Story, you can also choose to release a game before all the bugs are ironed out, although it will certainly impact reviews and how well your game does. It is sometimes necessary in order to gain some extra cash. So as I already mentioned, you also do have this gaming history section, which will give you a breakdown on every game you sold between the number of fans it gained you, the top sales rank, profitability. So as you can see, Crusader King's Crusader has made me over 40 grand, while Fantasy Final has lost over 6 grand. It also gives you the cost, total units sold, and the platform that it's on. One other thing that you will want to do in this game as well is every now and then you may want to design a custom game engine. Um, which can help improve your games. So we're going to do that here now. Um, researching the ability to develop a, a game engine um, only costs research points, but after that when you put together an engine it, it costs actual money to develop. So we'll take a look at that here in a second. So here now that we've researched a custom game engine we've got an option to create an engine. So we'll call it Power Sim since most of the games we do are simulation based you then can include what you want the the uh, engine to support so supporting 2d graphics mono sound linear story and save game options um, 
are all things that you can include. Now, what you can include in a game engine, uh, there you can see the uh, Sega Master System just released, what you can include in a game engine actually um, depends on what you've researched so far. So you can research different accessories and things like that, but until you research them, you can't include them in your game engine. So if you want to build a game that supports a joystick or a steering wheel, you've got to make a whole new game engine to support that if the game engine you have now does not support that type of feature, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, that's definitely a, a difference between this game and game dev stories. There's really no backstory to developing, you know, the engine behind the game, which is just as important, obviously, as what goes into the game, because it's basically the game's end. Well, it's, it's the engine. It's literally what powers the game. Um, so it doesn't get a whole lot of attention, you know, but it, it's obviously critical. Then, as you can see there, since I developed that game engine that supported 2D graphics version 2, I can include that now in my games when I uh, develop a game with a game engine. It also gives you the option to include linear stories and save games. So that's definitely something that I didn't have an option for before when I didn't have a game engine. Now there are features you can include. They cost a little extra, but you couldn't include them before if you didn't have those... Uh, if you didn't have those features unlocked or if you didn't have that game engine that included them. So it gives you a lot more customization options over um, over your game, basically. And now that I've finished that game, you'll obviously see as well that the quality of the game was much higher in terms of design and technology with my own game engine. Also, as the game progresses, you unlock more features which you can research and unlock. So. Um, at this point, you know, I can unlock a joystick, a gamepad, researching target audience will allow you to target your game toward certain types of groups so you can get better sales and better focus on your game, level design, you know, including a level editor, cut scenes, uh, better AI, open world design, all these different features are, are things that you can um, start researching as the game progresses. And on the right here, you can see my first game with my first uh, game engine has been r remarkably more successful than any of the games which I sold previously. One other thing I really enjoy about this game, to be honest as well, is that um, it offers the option for a truly viable computer gaming console. Uh, game dev story, for example, the PCs, the console you start on, but consoles quickly take over and you know, you're not going to generate anywhere near the sales on a PC as you would on a gaming console. And while that's still certainly true in this game, 15% um, market share, for example, is definitely something that's, um, you know, it's it's not something to sneeze at. It's something that actually you can make money off. Um, so that's one, you know, interesting thing about this game is that it, it does still give some viability to PC gaming, whereas... Um, game dev story basically writes it off as kind of the tutorial. Alright, let's go ahead and develop our first game for the um, for a console now. Just want to take a look at a few of the title names I've got here. Okay. So, we're going to go ahead and make it a fantasy RPG. We're going to put it on the TES, which is short for the NES. Now, by this point, we're about four years into the game. You can see the Sega Master System is out, as well as the TES and the Game Boy, as they call the Game Ling. Now, one thing you'll notice here, you have to pay a license fee to be able to develop on consoles. That's very historical, um, something that still goes on today, and it's one of the things that a lot of analysts and developers are saying is kind of the is something that could be the death knell for consoles because with as cheap as it is to develop on Android or on um, iOS, you know, you might only have to pay $100 to get a license to develop on uh, iOS, whereas often to develop on PlayStation or Xbox, you have to actually pay tens of thousands of dollars or thousands of dollars at the very least in order to get your game, you know, to be able to be played and sold on that console. So it's something that you're you're seeing a lot of news about these days with regards to uh, PlayStation and Xbox to a lesser degree reaching out to independent developers to try and convince them, you know, to, to focus on their console over someone else's. Um, so it's definitely something where um, the model 
probably needs to change if councils are going to have any hope to survive. Um, and you kind of see the council developers slowly uh, adjusting to that. But it's definitely going to take a little time. I mean, if you think about it, these these types of things used to be their cash cows. You know, every company that wanted to develop on a game had to pay the um, the gaming console company, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And that company really had to do nothing uh, to earn that tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so it was one way to recoup the costs of these, you know, development cycles for these systems, which is billions and billions of dollars. Um, but you know there may be, there may be need to be another way. Uh, people keep talking about the fact that consoles may be dying, and it could be true. Um, but people have been saying the PC gaming is dying for years, and you know it's obviously still alive and doing better than ever in many many regards. Hardware sales are down, but I think you know a lot of that is tablets and phones, but a lot of it is also um, the fact that some of these games. Um, you know, aren't really pushing the envelope in terms of what a computer can do. And I don't mean that games aren't pushing the envelope so much as systems are so powerful nowadays that um, they stay relevant and for longer. So gamers, at the very least, don't have to buy a new system quite as often as they used to, um, which is a good thing for PC gaming. Needing to buy a new $600 system every couple of days is, uh, is, a, is a bad thing. Um, in my mind for a uh, an industry. Another thing which does happen in here as you see that little news article is over time consoles are removed from the market so the G64 is going to be removed from, from the market shortly. Um, basically uh, it's just too old and um, that'll happen for the TES eventually then I'm sure they'll come out with a Super TES. Same for the Vena they'll probably come out with the Sega Master System and just kind of the natural progression of a game like this, but it is a nice little twist because it's uh, something that kind of keeps you on your toes. You don't want to buy a, a license to develop for a console that's just about to be, you know, discontinued. Another example of the industry news or news from the game being very interesting and, and well put together is it kind of gives you historical snippets from, for example, when uh, G6 or Govador or Commodore uh, went bankrupt essentially. Um, gives you kind of those historical insights and little input and um, definitely sets it apart from uh, just being a kind of a short game if you will or a, a you know a pocket game it's definitely a longer experience and a more intuitive experience also that's nice I didn't know it gives you a little summary of each console and you know how much you made off of it over the course of its life Alright, now it's time to go ahead. Let's create a new game engine. This is really going to be designed for consoles, so we'll call it the NES engine. Because I really want to include all these features which I've been working on, um, like simple cutscenes. Uh, you could use a steering wheel on it. A joystick's more of a PC thing, so we'll leave that off. Better dialogue. Level editor, again, is a PC thing. Better AI and open world, so over almost a quarter of a million dollars being spent on this game engine here. You can definitely see how things get expensive real fast in game development and that certainly will escalate as this game goes on I'm sure. Um, I had over almost a half a million dollars in cash and almost all of that got eaten up by this new game engine. One thing that's really enjoyable about this game uh, more so than other games, and I keep talking about game dev story, but that's probably what people are going to see a lot of similarities to, is how difficult it can be. You know, it's not too hard when you're in your garage. You're not going to go bankrupt when you're not paying anyone except yourself. But the game is definitely a lot harder. You just aren't going to churn out hit after hit after hit. Uh, what? Proposition. Agent. Well, that's an interesting little twist. So, do you want to spend 40 grand to find out some useful information? But I'm guessing there's a risk that it's worth nothing. So, sure, let's see. Okay. 40 grand to research a mystery. I don't think that was worth it, but whatever. Okay, the NES engine is complete. So, now that we have a new gaming engine and we've developed some things, we can kind of more target our games to who we want to sell the games to here real quick so just a moment so we'll just target this one to everyone it's going to be a fantasy rpg on the 
TES. And interestingly enough, the PC is now gaining in market share basically on everyone except for the two portable gaming consoles. What would be nice is to see the total number of um, units that are on the market, more so than a market share percentage, because it's still kind of hard to decide if you want to develop for a certain uh, game or not, if uh, it, or a certain console or not, if you don't know how many consoles are even you know out there and people are buying things for. It does seem easier in this game to get well-rated reviews, but it doesn't necessarily translate into hundreds of thousands of sales either, so... It's interesting that the licensing cost of the Super NES or Super TES is half that of the Sega. I wonder if that's actually accurate. But uh, let's try developing for a portable handheld console. So we'll see. I've never done a portable console before, so we'll see how this turns out. Be funny if you could build a steering wheel into a portable. I don't know if any portables ever have had that as an accessory. I don't think so. One annoying thing is occasionally you seem to stop to scratch your head, and I'm not quite sure what that means, if that's just your way of resting for a moment or two, but it did, you know, will cause you occasionally to miss a contract if you're running tight. And you do that for, you know, 20 seconds. Play system. A prototype console called the Play System. Did they work on the PlayStation years in advance? It does look like the NES. I wonder if that's supposed to be that... Oh, there you go. Collaboration with Nintendo. Super STES with a CD drive. Interesting. So, there were years ago, there was uh, originally Nintendo and Sony had partnered for the PlayStation. Um, but that deal turned south, so I've never seen a game include that type of detail in it as far as like that storyline so that's kind of an interesting little thing to to include there but let's see how my uh portable game console sells or my portable game not bad that's nice very nice maybe we've got a hit almost 20,000 units in the first month i don't think i've ever done that well before Really? That's interesting. Well below target, but it's still incredibly profitable for me, so I guess I don't really care. We're going to make a sequel to Pirates. Since that was my most successful game for a while. So we're getting kind of close to it, and I may actually hit it with this game. But when you get to a million dollars, you can actually choose if you want to go to a larger office. Um, if you decide to do that, it's uh, basically kind of like going on to the next level where you can start to hire more people than just yourself. And it really brings you into kind of a more deeper, more immersive game. So far, I really like this game. It definitely is a, a pretty pretty deep game, and it's only 7 bucks. So, I mean, it's definitely worth something, you know, worth checking something out. Um, holy cow. This is going to be a hit. We'll wait. I want to see how this sells. Okay, well that kind of contradicts itself. It said it wasn't as successful as we had hoped, and yet it was way more successful than people expected. Whatever. Probably sell 200,000 units or more. Yep, over 200,000. Anyway, that's probably about to do it. About done with this uh, with this video here. This is the first, and I guess what we'll call a let's play for uh, this game. Uh, game Dev Tycoon. I really enjoyed it. It's a nice little simple easy game. Kind of a beer and pretzels game, but there's a lot of strategy to it. Um, as you get deeper and deeper into the game and you know you unlock more um, options, um, it also means it makes it even harder to succeed. So with like the target audience factor that we had seen, uh, if I don't target the audience right I may not maximize sales, where before I had it researched I didn't have to worry about that. Um, so definitely something where uh, you know, as you kind of get further into the game, costs are escalating, you know, to develop even at more advanced AI. Now it's over $100,000. So while I may have over a million dollars, it's not hard seeing how I could definitely, you know, go bankrupt at some point because uh, you need to manage costs very carefully. 
uh, much like a real game development studio does. You know, you see a lot of these companies struggling today, and it's not for lack of sales. You know, Tomb Raider is breaking all sorts of sales records, and yet Square Enix is doing terrible financially, so that they put themselves into a position where, you know, Tomb Raider needs to be even more successful than is probably realistically possible. Um, so there's a lot going on here, um, and it's a very interesting game. Um, definitely something I'm going to keep doing, a couple more videos. I am also working on a four video series for the Battle of Chancellorsville 150th anniversary. That'll start going up on May 1st using Scourge of War. In addition to that, I'm also working on a new project called um, Dueling Dreadnoughts. That's about all I'll say about it at the moment, but i um, got a lot of stuff going on. I'd like to, with Dueling Dreadnoughts, start to kind of make a, a more... Uh, polished approach. This is a pretty raw video. You know, I kind of put it together just, you know, I was playing the game, decided wanted to go ahead and uh, do a let's play or a, kind of an initial impressions type thing. But um, I'd like to, you know, make my games more polished and more professional. But to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about video editing and um, definitely something that I'd be new at, but still something that I think I'd enjoy. So, um, you know, that's one of those things that probably weighs down the line. But, um, I'd like to have more interesting things to talk about and keep you all active, interested, and in, you know, engaged. And uh, but anyway, um, that's going to do it for this video. And um, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.